Welcome to the show, In Conversation series, a collaboration between Clusterview and the BTM Club. Today we have, I think she's a mega lady, so much so that I've had to have my notes here because she's done so much, I will never remember all of it. Welcome, Tina Treadwell. Uh, Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming down to talk to us. Lovely to see you and thank Look at you so this much smile. for having me. Look at this smile, lighting up the screen. How have you been? I've been really good. Miss um, International. Uh, well, he's saying that because um, I live in Los Angeles. I uh, grew up in Englewood, New Jersey, which is a suburb of New York City. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm here is because uh, of my family's heritage and relationship with music management, most particularly the Drifters. Wait until you hear the story. <laughs> But um, my father, George Treadwell, was one of the first black entertainment managers, and um, back in the 50s, that was not the norm. Not heard of. And um, he had been a trumpet player, uh, worked with all the big greats, Count Basie, what have you, um, uh, met Sarah Vaughan, was heralded as being kind of his, her Svengali. Well, they were married, he managed her, um, took her to the height of her career. Um, many of her albums had the George Treadwell Orchestra behind it. Right. Um, and then he also managed Billie Holiday at the end of her career, Ruth Brown, uh, Sammy Davis, um, and um, Dinah Washington, and most um, famously, The Drifters, um, uh, who we co-founded with Clyde McFadder. So he was one of the co-founders of The Drifters? Yes, that is correct. So he put it together? Yes, along with Clyde McFadder, um, and also at the ur urging of Ahmet Erdogan, who was then, then president of Atlantic Records. Right. Um, they were interested in doing um, a group, a, you know, a deal with Clyde, but they, my dad and Atlantic felt it would be better to have a group around him, and so um, they put together the Drifters. The Drifters. And, um, and my father and his idea of the sound, um, and they were co-partners in the group, and so it's sort of like the other members came and go, came and went, but Clyde was there, and then when Clyde left, he bought out my father, my Clyde's share, and so then he became right. the, you know, it was, so it was really the beginning of a But it's brand. a great evolution where your father was concerned, because he was in the industry, so he knew about it as a musician. Yes, that is correct. And knew what musicians would want, like a lot of the unfair treatment that they might have had from their management. He would then come now, and his career evolved from being a musician to a manager, and kind of would know how to treat his artists. No, absolutely. And I think that as a musician, um, in terms of the, the style and the tone of the music, um, I think that he was influential in that, because when you think of the hits over the years, and there were probably 60 odd drifters, you know, who've come in and out of the group. Over but the, the years. Yes, but the Treadwell brand, I mean, the music that he, in the tone that he set was the thing that continued throughout. Right. And that's, you know, so I really, you know, kind of think about the drifters of being the, sort of the beginning of the, the brand as opposed to this, the artists, although there were amazing artists that came through it, right. like Benny King and the uh, incomparable Johnny Moore, um, who came And they through. were all in the drifters at some point? Yes, yes, they were. See? History right here. <laughs> who knew Benny King was in the drifters? Oh, absolutely. Um, and he was Benny Nelson, and then he changed his name to Benny King. He right. left and had a solo career, and then he actually came back to the group for a while um, in his latter, eight, latter years um, before he passed away. And, um, you know, it's just an amazing journey that the group has taken. And, um, you know, I'm here in London right now because, um, you know, there was some, there had always been sort of controversy when my father died, um, different, you know, partners that my father had wanted to take over the group. My mom bought them out. And then as a, being a woman in the business now, being one of the first black entertainment music managers, now being a female overseeing this group, um, there were either promoters or agents or even members who knew who wanted to sort of fight her, you know, continually being a part because my father um, you know, she kind of became his gal Friday at the beginning and then they became like partners. partners. He, he looked at her as that and, and so... And that's really interesting because they were married, he was the manager, yes. but she being married to him was helping him in the beginning mm -hmm. and then she's literally inherited it 
Right. Now he's gone. Yes, my father um, passed away when I was nine years old of lung cancer. Right. And at that time, you know, you know, I mean, because he ma managed um, Sammy Davis, um, you know, Frank Sinatra called the house the day that my father had died. And, you know, and then she was sort of left with, you know, what am I going to do, you know, and to keep our life going in the manner which it had been. She felt yeah, this sure. was the only thing that she could do was take it over. And then, you know, there were people who were just sort of like trying to take it away from her. And, and there is always that element, isn't there, that people who have passed through think that they somehow have a right no, to it, absolutely. even though they were just passing through and they weren't the founders. Right. And so it's really interesting, you know, because, you know, there were so many um, members who'd come and gone, you know, members would leave and then yeah. try to start up their own. And, you know, and this is sort of an interesting line um, from the musical that is now on the West End that's talking ab about my parents' story, The Drifter's Girl. You know, one of the lines is like, you know, the Yankees are the Yankees. And even if some of the players leave, this they're thing. not they can't go and start a Yankees because there's only one New York Yankees and and that's really you know what the element of this story is all about that the drifters were really the concept of you know Clyde and George Treadwell and then when Clyde less it was George's to continue and that music and that trend happened and when there were problems in the states you know whether you know there was a, a fault a false trademark gotten to then try to force her out she brought the group to London and they ended up ha continuing their um, dominance in music and had a, n a lot of hits. So that when did that happen? Here. When did she bring them to London? In 1972. Right. And um, it was, um, you know, uh, an amazing journey for her because, you know, she ended up needing to, you know, keep have a nanny, take care of me. She moved yeah. here. And then my whole life from that point was coming to London every Thanksgiving and Easter. She would come home every Christmas and summer. And um, London became my second home. So it was sort of apropos that um, all these years later, um, when, you know, jukebox musicals were kind of, you know, the thing where there was, you know, ain't too proud to bed, beg with the Temptations or, you know, Jersey Boys or the Frankie Valley story, you know. Um, that drifters were part of that. Well, certainly, but had never had their own story. Their music had been a part of um, Smokey Joe's Cafe, you know, and also um, most recently, A Beautiful by Carol King, because um, Carol King had written a few of, of the Drifters' songs. Oh, right. Yes, and so um, interestingly enough, um, a music. Musical producer impresario of Great Britain. His name is Michael Harrison. Yeah. He, um, I believe, helped bring Beautiful to London's West End. And when he saw the show, he noticed that when the British Drifters music played, all of a sudden the audiences were like, ah, yeah, you know. And then you when see the, the thing is, what's great about the Drifters are they're one of those groups that have transcended age, transcended color. Because when you go to any event and the drifters come on, everybody knows the songs, everybody's singing them, and you're looking at an array of races and colors. No, absolutely. And as I say, it transcends even the age because if the parents are playing it in the house, their children know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how it was. And I think that also, um, if you listen to the lyrics of a lot of drifter songs, um, they're really... Um, narratives. They're telling stories story. about life yeah. um, and love and heart and relationships in such a way that um, it, it touches you and, and also makes you joyful. And deals like, you know, if there are problems, you know, you go, you know, you go up on the roof, you know, you know there's, there's a place where you can go. Yeah. Where their troubles, you know, go far away, you know, or, you know, or, or, mo or falling in love or like go under the boardwalk. That's where I'll go. You know, and it's just well, you like see, it, under it, the boardwalk. That's one of the tunes that has transcended everything. You know, no, absolutely. So, I mean, the, it, the interesting thing is that, you know, Michael, when he heard the realized that he goes, hmm, 
wow, this music, everyone's happy, but like, has there been something? And there hasn't. And he didn't want to just sort of do a regular one. And then when he did research, he started finding articles about my mom and the fights that she had because even here in London, agents, producers, promoters were trying to, to, to wrestle the group away and she'd have to go into lawsuits and she'd win. And so finally there's you know two big lawsuits, one in the States, one here that she won. And he said, ah, you know what, that's an entry point and that's different. Yeah. And so um, I got a call from him in 2017 asking if he could option the story of my parents and me uh, for a, a musical. And um, I said, sure. And so we tossed around some ideas. Um, I gave him a number of people from her life to, who were still alive to interview. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that's the thing, you know, when, when you're dealing with people of a certain vintage, I like to say vintage, not age, mm -hmm. you have to make sure you get these stories. No, Because absolutely. as you say, you know, People are slipping away. They're at that age where they're slipping away. And with them goes the story. No, absolutely. So, it's, you know, you really have to try and catch these stories before they're all gone. And the thing is also is that, you know, there's so many stories like this that are sort of unsung heroes that people don't even realize. And so I'm so grateful to Michael for having the insight to come to me and to, you know, to bring this to the world stage. And um, a man named Ed Curtis wrote the script um, and, you know, a really talented director, Jonathan Church directed it. And, but the, the most beautiful part is that um, the actors, because of COVID, were involved in this for a while and they had to like, you know, take time off and, and through that process they workshopped it and they, you know, you know. So it obviously started before COVID yes. hit. Yes, 2017 Thing, was when right. the story was optioned. It was supposed to actually premiere in 2019, right. but then COVID happened. And so it put it on hold for two years. But during that period, the story ended up changing. The first script that they brought was very, to me, was very different. And I g gave them notes and said, no, wait, this is, not you know, right. not quite right. Because the way it was originally um, conceived was really coming from the court cases being the center of it. Right. But, um, you know, they were the, making it more about the group story. At the, the, and, the, and, the court and, cases. And, yes, exactly. But the point is, is that if you're sort of looking at Faye Treadwell, you know, the one thing you did know about her, especially after my dad died, that, you know, her life was me. Yeah. And keeping my father's legacy. And so the girl, the drifters girl. <laughs> yes. And so, um, you know, bringing in the element of her being a mother. Yeah. Evolved and changed. And it was just so beautiful that the creatives behind it saw that, understood it, and then revamped the story. And in the midst of it, once the cast had been chosen, um, and it was an incredible cast, um, you know, headed by um, Beverly Knight, right. who um, played That's the, the role. original cast. Yes, who played, you know, my mother, Faye Treadwell. And then there are four um, actors who um, play every male role in right. the play. And it's Adam J. Bernard, Taryn Collender, Matt Henry, and Tashwan Gumat. They're all amazing actors. They've all, you know, been, many of whom have been nominated for Olivier Awards. The Drifter's Girl itself was nominated for two. Beverly was nominated for Best Actress. Right. Um, and, and the ensemble, the play itself was uh, nominated for Best Musical. And I had the privilege of coming back over and walking the red carpet with the cast and being at the Olivier Awards. And, you know, we were up against like huge titles, you know, um, and, and yet it was the most proud moment to have the musical be recognized. Well, listen, I was just going to say the recognition, because to be there, it's about the recognition. They finally recognized the part that the drifters have played, your mother has played. And the, the story itself is multifaceted because it's not just about the forming of the group, it's about the forming of the group, how they worked, how they rose to the top, the lawsuits after your father died, your mother managing you, and inheriting the role as manager of the Drifters. So it's, it's quite a lot going on in the Drifters Girl. Yes, It's absolutely. not just about the songs, you know. And you know, and again, what you were saying in terms of how the Drifters music transcends race and age, I mean, I think that, you know, even in the telling of the story, 
Um, you know, the, we, a very wonderful costume designer, Faye Fullerton, who's African American, was there. The choreographer is there, and yet at the same time, you know, you know, a, a, a Caucasian director and writer and producer, but you know, uh, with a story, you know, kind of inspired by me, yeah. um, that there is this this beautiful melding. And when you see the audiences, they're you know multifaceted, and at the same time, you know, for me. Um, it was really important for me to do this interview with you and to, you know, in this partnership that you have because, you know, I really, you know, the show is going to started um, in uh, previews in Newcastle in October um, of last year. And then it moved to the Garrick Theater on the West End um, November um, 3rd, I believe, um, in 2021. And then opening night, press night, was the, our Thanksgiving in the States, which is usually like the 27th yeah. of, of November, and then ran you know, this whole year. Um, and now closing is going to be October 15th. And so, you know, um, obviously, you know, West End you know, shows, you know, they can be a little pricey, but at the same time, you know, there's history being told there, and I think it's a really important story. And so I really wanted there to be, um, you know, one last push for, you know, before it goes on tour, because it will go on tour right. around Great Britain, but, okay. you know, for people to come and see it still in the West End. But you know what? There's something... And especially people of color. Yes. We need to get more into the theater and support these kind of things and not think, you know, theater's not for me. Other people, it's for other people. And as you say, it's good to see people of color and encourage them to come out and... Go to the theater and, this and see this cast these is just unbelievable. You know, Adam I think was um, nominated for Olivia Award for, or maybe won one for Dream Girls. Um, you know, Matt Hendry, um, you know, won an award for Kinky Boots and was also oh, in The yeah. Lion King. Um, Tosh, Tosh was also in The Lion King. Um, and, you know, Taryn, you know, as well, you know, all of them are incredibly accomplished actors and Beverly Knight, you know, who I've always seen as being kind of like the Jennifer Holiday of Great Britain, like she's just, she was a force of nature and she was a beautiful woman and actress to really give the first voice to um, my mother's story. Um, but now um, Beverly um, was only contracted for a certain amount of time. She was with the show most of the run, um, but then she went on to do Sister Act and in the meantime yeah. Michael found the most talented actress. Her name is Felicia Boswell. Um, she um, is a Grammy nominated, you know, Tony Award winning actress um, and she's doing um, you know, honor to my mother and, and had, took the reins yeah. and has done very well and was very happy to come and, and see said, her And as you said, it started in other parts of the UK, but there's something prestigious about feeling like I've arrived when you get to the West End Theatre, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's like theater in the States. When you get to Broadway, you know you've arrived. Exactly. And um, in, in the Garrick and the owners there, you know, have been so wonderful. And, you know, and it's been a, it, it, when you walk, when I still walk, you know, you know, Charing Cross and I see, you know, the Drifters, the Drifters girls, girls on the bus. Just, yeah. Yeah. It just, you know, goosebumps. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, you know, you know, there are aspects of my story and my parents' story that's, you know, you see depicted on stage and it's like, it's very surreal yeah. to see kind of like 12, nine year old Tina on the stage, you know, talking and with, and, and seeing aspects of, or aspects of my parents' life. And it, it, it brought me to tears many, many times and I've seen it many, many times and yeah. I still cry. Um, but it's, it's a really powerful well, it's story literally of your empowerment. Life. It's literally your life. So, you know, it will touch you. And I think it will touch everyone. I mean, I think that it, there's something in this musical for everyone. But it's certainly a, a female empowerment story. It's a you know story about motherhood, but it's a story about you know of, you know men you know talented men who came and their stories behind it. You know the story behind Benny King or Rudy Lewis or Johnny Moore. I mean, it, they're just these people who you know really gave so much of their lives to music. Yeah. And you know, and also you know our place in history in terms of what we brought to music. It's important to celebrate. I don't think that's see. ever been hidden. Everybody <laughs> knows it, but they don't give you the recognition. But it's blatantly obvious because of the, the copying, the replica. You can see, well, yeah, they took that from the Four Tops or the Drifters or the <laughs> Temptations, you know.
Yeah, How long absolutely. did the play take to put together to write? Um, pro it probably took about you know nine months. Wow! It took some time, you know. But I think you know the interview. Well, I think that's quite quick, isn't it? Well, yeah, but then you know again, that's less than a year. Yeah, but then it evolves, you know. You know, right. then then there's some rewrites, and then again, the cast. I will say, put their heart and soul on it. So, you know, again, you have someone who gives us kind of template, and then you have these living people who we are put after, different you know, energy into and, it. Yeah, yeah, you know, black English or whatever, just saying, well, I wouldn't say it like this. I would say this, or this is what I'm thinking, and you know, and there was truly like a collaboration. So, you know, you know, Michael's forethought, you know, and our, you know. Um, Chris Egan, who was a music producer, you know, really great um, in terms of inputting songs, you know, in, in proper places that really tell the narrative. So much so, what's interesting for me is that, you know, Faye has, you know, three big ballads, um, you know, and, right. and I was like, oh my God, well, I know all these Drifter songs, but who wrote those songs? And he's like, those are Drifter songs. I go, what? <laughs> yeah. and, Even you didn't know that. Yeah, and what happened is that they listened to everything. And, you know, back in the day when there were records, um, you know, 45s. I really am too young to oh, know about records yes, of okay. vinyl. I know nothing about this. <laughs> but <laughs> the B-sides were just sometimes filler songs, you yeah. know. And yet there were some B-side songs that they found that were so intrinsically perfect for moments. That's that, really and research, then, and, isn't and, it? And, no, absolutely. And then, you know, you know, and you take a song, you know, like Harlem Child, and, you know, and when, you know, when a man at one point is saying child, they're talking about his girl, yeah. but then when you're actually talking about to a child, and it, it changed everything, and it was like, oh my God. And as you say, you know, you needed the real people, the actors, to put those little nuances in there that make it real. Mm -hmm. Because just writing something down is one thing, but you give it to somebody and they say, no, we wouldn't say it like this, or no, we wouldn't do it like that. And it makes it, it well, gives it life. Well, true collaborations where real art is created. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. We said the same thing at the same <gasps> time. Absolutely, see that? <laughs> <laughs> now, you have to excuse me, because I've got my notes here, because this woman's accolades <laughs> I will never remember all of them. Now, casting director, talent manager, network TV executive, theater and film director, president of Treadwell Entertainment. I mean, you don't look old enough to have been able to do all of wow. this. Um, <laughs> black don't crack. <laughs> so they say it's not working here, is it? <laughs> no, but... Um, um, I've been very blessed. The only thing that is not um, true of the things that you gave me is that I did not direct film. Oh, okay. Produced film. Produced, okay. But um, all, I've directed theater um, and produced theater, and, um, but all those other things are correct. Um, I, um, you know, I was very privileged um, you know, to have gone to Princeton University, which is one of the Ivy yeah. Leagues in the U.S., and, you know, also, you know, on the blood, sweat and tears of my mom, you know, was blessed to, you know, not have to, I could just study and I didn't have to work through school. So I, so grateful to my mother for that support. So that um, you could actually focus on what you were supposed to do, your studies and right. not be doing a, a day job or, a, you know, no, and then absolutely. trying to study at two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, actually I wanted to be an entertainer because I was around entertainers my whole life. I was that girl singing in the mirror with, I was going to say, you the had brush. the hairbrush, didn't you? I you did, had I the did, hairbrush. I had the hairbrush, but you know, it was like one of those things when I graduated, you know, I didn't want to make my mother put me, put, have her put me through grad school, you know, because I'd want to, I thought about going to Yale Drama School, blah, blah, blah. And so I ended up putting myself through my own little film school and I was also trying to audition on the side and I was like waiting tables and then and she was like, I put you through this school for you to be doing what? And so she, and it was sort of one of those things. The next thing I know, my um, godfather was one of our, my mom's friends, gave me a call. Heard you're looking for a job. And I go, I am? And he goes, yeah, well, come by my office. And he had a production company. Um, and, okay. uh, you know, they worked on music specials and commercials. And then immediately he kind of goes, you have an eye for talent here. You know, just start putting people down. I think you had and, a bit of an advantage, didn't you? <laughs> and, and then I sort of put myself in my own film school. I started, you know, I worked for film editors. I worked for a film distribution company company. I ran, did camera on a, a cable access kind of, um, station that covered Wall Street. I mean, I did all these things. And then I decided I wanted to move to California. 
um, because of the weather and also because that was really where Hollywood was and I felt you know my mom you know had such a rough time in the music business she like was like she was like stay away you know all like, oh, right okay, so she fine. was actually discouraging you oh, from, absolutely. from she, getting she into she the said industry you either you know you know become an executive or marry well you know one of the two <laughs> and so I um, moved to LA and I started working in the theater and um, and directed um, some theater and then one of the um, associates at the theater um, where I was working mentioned, you, you again, you have a really great eye for talent. You should start working for casting directors. I do on the side. I go, okay. And so I went to this bookstore, you know, and I got a list of all the casting directors in LA. I just started reaching out and I started working for some commercial casting directors. And then um, an assistant and I who had been working for one particular who like had gone away for like three months and we had done all of our work. And go, you know, we should take this reel and go out and start our own company, which we did. And then and after you know casting you know a myriad of co national commercials, I kind of got bored and I said there's got to be something else. So I took a sort of a, a, a sabbatical away from that. I started working for some theatrical casting directors, especially a woman named Shimon Bernard, and and I ended up she gave me the opportunity to cast the second season of In Living Color, and um, oh, okay. and I got to you know re meet Keenan and this work with some Keenan really talent. And Cal, is it? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's Keenan. different. No, no, Keenan. No, no, okay. Different, different Keenan. But, um, you know, just uh, Keenan Wayans. Right. You know, the Wayans oh, brothers. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, the Wayans yeah, So, um, but uh, just learn about that. We did series um, and pilots, and then um, I said, okay, this is what I want to do is to go inside a network somewhere and, and figure out how series and movies or specials are created so I could become a content provider because casting is great and you're sort of handing over the meals to someone else, but then they're... You know, reaping the benefits yes. of them. Yeah. So I did, so I um, sort of, you know, then I was at a party and I was talking to. It always starts at a party. Yeah. <laughs> and I was taught, I ended up talking to this guy who was a writer uh, for a TV show. And I had mentioned that my father had my, managed, among other people, Diana Washington. He goes, so interesting you mentioned her because there's an actress who was just on our show and she was talking about Diana Washington. And I was thinking, well, that would be an interesting story to write. So I'm, I'm writing a musical about it. And he said, like, would you be interested in producing it? I'm like going, why yes, and I remember okay. like calling my mom and saying, "Look, you know, I have this opportunity to produce this play. I might need to take some time off. Um, if you, if, you, if I need help financially, because I'm going to stop working for a little while, I promise you." And this was like in May. By January, I'll have a job. And she goes, "What do you mean have a job? We're entrepreneurs. We don't work for people." Yeah. And I'm like going, "Yeah, just trust me." And yeah. so she did, and I ended up, um, you know, I'm working with um, Oliver Goldstick, who was the writer who went on to, you know, create, you know, write um, the big series *Pretty Little Liars*. And um, okay. he actually recently wrote one of the episodes of *Bridgerton*. Like he's, you know, moved up incredibly over the years. Um, and Douglas Sills, who was a Broadway actor. Um, he was the first Scarlet Pimpernel on Broadway, and we worked together on this musical. And it was so successful, and it was one of those things, kind of like the Drifters Girl, where everybody who came to see it, you know, I mean, Dinah, Watt, Dinah Ross came to see it, Whitney Houston came to see it, like all the development companies came to see it because, you know, Dinah's music. Yeah. was similar where it crossed it, all generations and, and, and everybody at and, some point you know different races and so the audiences were diverse and it was you know sold out every night and we and all got our monies back and it, that um, Woody Allen's then um, partner Gene DeMaggio and took it on and then took it off Broadway so it was successful and so because of all the people that came to see it they were like saying so who are you and what do you want to do and I basically told them and then eventually people started saying there's somebody who's looking for someone just like you and it was an executive that was coming from Nickelodeon to go to Disney Channel to revamp the Disney Channel because Nickelodeon at that time sort of had kind of usurped the kids brand mm. and uh, he was looking for a sort of an atypical casting person to come in and lead up the talent department and, at, um, and uh, I ended up getting an interview and I ended up getting the job and when I told my mom I told her by January I'd have I a job. I told you. <laughs> I started January 7th and then was on the planes and it said January 8th to um, start our first music special franchise um, and we ended and it was with a young um, young youth act, uh, singer named Leanne Rhymes who was oh. the at the time 15 years old and um, she had just gotten a gold record and someone had you know approached us um, Disney with the uh, concept of doing music specials for kids and he asked me if you can figure out a way to do them then you could start early before we have shows for you to cast 
So, you know, he saw that I had music in my background, and so... Um, not just music. Yeah, so, not just music. So, Come Jeb on. Ryan, who was uh, the uh, executive from the film company that they hired, you know, we sat and figured out the template of uh, the In Concert series, like on a napkin, uh, you know, at the bar, you know, at the Yacht Club at, the, you know, Disney. And we did it. And so then we went on to do um, Johnny Lang, and we did... Um, and we're most famously in sync, which basically launched in sync. Um, we did Backstreet Boys, we did um, Britney Spears. So, you know, um, I was really, you know, instrumental, you know, because I was the in house executive producer of all of these in concerts um, music specials. Right. And so it helped, you know, sort of revamp pop music and that culture. So all of a sudden we were looking Well, brilliant. it's interesting because you majored at Princeton in literature, right? Yes, English literature. See, I've so done I my little bit of research uh, there. So, but, <laughs> so how has that come into what you do now? Because well, it's all about storytelling, isn't it? True. I mean, you know, Chaucer, Milton, Shakespeare, you know, the things that I was most interested in were, you know, narrative storytelling, but also religion. Because um, my grandfather was a Baptist minister, my mother's father in Texarkana, Texas, and Arkansas. And, you know, and I, you know, when I went to school, it was like, you know, the things that I was gravitating towards was, you know, the fact that in the Elizabethan times, the only people who were literate were people who came through the church. And so those men wrote stories that were infused with biblical, you know, references. references. Yeah. And so because of my, you know, background in the church as well, it's like I could understand the concepts. And, um, you know, and really when you think I was also interested in psychology and the, the relationships and the family dynamics, whether it's Romeo and Juliet or whether it's yeah. The Tempest, uh, the, it's ultimately, all about everything is psychology, psychology yeah. and faith and what yeah, you're crying everything. to God for whatever and, and relationships. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that if you are, you know, that you're drawn to that, then you can write papers about it because you're taking real life situations and you're understanding through the psychology of these characters. What's the underlying All the themes observations, of what's going on. and then with the literacy, you've got the ability to word it mm -hmm. in a way that it will grab people. And then it's all then about being a, a communicator. Yeah. And so as an executive, basically your job is really to help bring different facets of the business together and to have them understand what needs to be done in that moment. Yeah. Whether it's your staff or whether it's working with directors and producers or whether it's working with your you know heads of the company when you're trying to sell an idea or actor or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, I... Um, was very happy. My mom was very proud of me and, you know, and I got to, you know, she used to always take me to the Grammys and then I got to take her because, you know, I was invited and, you know, so it was a really beautiful thing. But then my mom was still managing the group, but then she ended up get, um, getting ill. Right. And I, I, and I ended up needing to take a severance package from Disney to be able to come to Europe and bring her home and get her settled and to try to... Because she actually then lived in the UK. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, um, I brought her back and actually took her to her mother's house. Her mother um, was 100 at the time, and her one of my mom's sisters was also staying with her, so I sort of placed her there for a little while, and then, you know, came back here to try to settle things, and then we had the same kind of thing where a tour manager was basically trying to do, you, this is now mine, because your mom's out. Can and you so imagine? then it became another battle. Fight. And, you know, Which is the last thing you need at a delicate time like that in your life when you're caring for your sick mother. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you know? It basic, so basically um, I ended up leaving the corporate life because I couldn't do that and help manage my mom and, um, and also fight what was going on in yeah. the UK. So um, I, it was sort of like that's how my company, Treadwell Entertainment Group, um, was born out of necessity to create a sort of home-based business that I could do. And then I started doing some speaking engagements around the country, talking to kids and their parents about the business, you know, based on my relationships and on my experiences right. at Disney. And then I'd sort of see kids in the middle of nowhere who had no access. And I just, you know, realized that maybe that was my calling to help these young people find a place. Give them the options op opportunities. And, and opportunities. Yeah. yeah. So, um, because you can only make choices when you've got opportunities. That is true. <laughs> and so there are a lot of young people who kind of like, I was like a Pied Piper who came from Nashville, <laughs> came from Chicago, came from Atlanta, came from Houston. Um, and then, you know, it was really interesting that, you know, one of the client, young clients that I met, 
um, in Houston. Um, he, they came to LA and the mom um, was really a smart businesswoman. She had had a cheer gym, um, dealt with parents and kids in that environment. Um, had, had some experience working in the hospital administration. Tried to sort of do that while her son was pursuing, pursuing acting, and then eventually she started like was bored and was like, you know, well, come, you know, help me out. And she put in a lot of sweat equity, and she's now my equal partner in the company. Her name is Kim Renee Coleman. Well, it is a highly inspirational story. It didn't necessarily come the way you would like because your mother had to inherit it because your father died young and you were you were young, mm -hmm. and then you inherited it because she was gone, yes. but. It's still a highly inspirational story. Yes, and then and you, one that should be told and heard. Yes, and then you know the beauty is is that you know she mentored a young man named um, Navi, who at the time was 15, and she saw him working at a, um, a singers and you know being like Michael Jackson, and she kind of gave him pointers and had him open up for her, and then he became the number one Michael Jackson tribute in the world, and oh, really? got to work. Um, at Sony Records would hire him to decoy for Michael and you know and he um, would wow. travel around the world and do that and then he started his own shows and has done shows all over the world and is still performing now but he ended up helping me regain the group and so like he, he manages them you know we co-manage but he really runs it here in the UK and we're, you see and again so, it is really about how that's why these stories are inspirational, I think, because it's really about how you live. You know, your mother was benevolent. She helped him and he did what he did, but he knew he had to come back and help you yes. do what you're doing now. And, and, and it beauty, started with her. And the beauty of it was that, you know, one day my business partner was looking at the breakdowns and saw that there was a Lifetime movie that was going to be done on Michael Jackson. And she immediately like called and said, wait, we have the perfect guy. Right. And so, you know, and then it so happened that I knew the director. I knew um, Suzanne DePass, who was executive producing it. And um, I uh, knew the casting director well. And so we you know, had to fight for him, but Navi ended up playing the Michael Jackson in the Lifetime movie. As you for, said earlier, it's about Neverland. communications and psychology. It's and, all about relationships. And relationships and, and something coming full circle so that you know, Navi had the opportunity to truly play um, Michael and to give homage to, you know, he plays homage to my mom by supporting me and the Drifters here in the UK and, and we were able to pay homage to him because he got to play Michael who his whole career, you know, was elevated through his genius, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's really great, you know, how relationships happen. So, Drifters Girl is closing, you said the 15th of October. Correct. In London. Yes. But it will be going on tour. Yes. Um, Get out there and see it. The Garrick West End. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So what's on the cards for you now? After well, that? you know, I, I th you know, it, interesting enough, um, you know, it was proper and true, especially for the story having, you know, been birthed in London because of my mother bringing them here and, and having this resurgence. Um, and before, you know, and it sort of, it, it was a really great thing. Um, but my father's story, you know, is really important to me. So I think that, you know, the, what I'm, my goal is, is to create, you know, a, a, a series that it would talk about each Yeah, decade. because if you said he's played with people like Count Basie and legends like that. There must be a huge story. No, the, there actually, and all the, and all that's the stars before that the he drifters. managed, you know, from you know Billy Holiday, Dinah Washington, yeah, Bruce Brown, there must Sam be a huge Davis. story there. So you know, that's something that I'm working on, you know, and uh, you know, again, you know, my partner Kim and I, you know, we're dedicated to helping young, you know, stars like elevate. Right. And so you know, we have. Um, you know, a girl named Naya Damas, and who's really talented, who's starring in the upcoming Monster High movie and the Monster High franchise, our client Dallas Young, who's in Cobra Kai series and is like well, the neat new lead there, you know, and, and it's just we've got some really great young talent that we're bringing up and really proud of that so that, you know, it be, you know, the way that, you know, we can look at the things that my father and the artists that my father helped bring to fruition. I'm hoping, you know, that it's the same with our company that, you know, we help these young people elevate. And that's but it's really great that in spite of all that you've achieved, you've still kept that fundamental thing of 
you've got to put something back and you've got to help people when you have the opportunity to help them. Oh, absolutely. It's all about paying it forward. Wonderful. Well, the pleasure and honor was all mine. Thank you for coming to talk to Clusterview and the BTM Club. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much for having me. And we look forward to getting to see Drifters Girls before it closes. As I said, make sure you get out there and see it. The Garrick Theatre West End, Drifters Girl. You heard it here first. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. All the best. Thank you. <laughs>